James Douglas. And he's going to talk to us on a topic that's rather different from our usual topics. We're going to learn about how to learn to live with the ticks that cause Lyme disease. James is a GP in Fort William and has been interested in ticks and Lyme disease for many years. And he also loves the wildflowers of the Scottish summer. We know as plant lovers that we're all very familiar with crouching down amongst the vegetation to get a closer look. And at the end of the day, we discover that we've got ticks so we maybe find them earlier on in the day. So now I'm gonna hand you over to James so that we can learn a little bit more about these annoying little critters that we meet when we're out botanizing. So over to James, thank you. All right, Mary, thank you very much. And thank you very much for inviting me to speak. Um, the reason I'm, I'm pleased that you're inviting me to speak is because I think unfortunately, um, you're all very high risk on your botanical trips of picking up ticks and what might happen. So I'm delighted that, that you've asked me. Um, I've been fascinated by, to hear your discussion about the winter heliotrope in Ardesia. I would love to see it. Um, and maybe at the end, you could tell me uh, where I can see it and what it looks like. I'm afraid I I've never seen one. Um, so anyway, we better get started. I've got about 40 slides to, to get through. So um, my plan is just really to slow, show you the slides and then we can, I can deal with any questions at the end. And my plan for the presentation is, is really this. I want to search, first of all, try and consider the eternal battle between humans and microbes, then discuss a little bit about the tick ecology and Lyme disease, um, then discuss why the increase in Lyme disease, if it has occurred, um, why it is possibly the theories around that. And then really importantly, what can we do about Lyme disease as individuals and as a society? And then talk a little bit about the current research programs um, and the current knowledge gaps in Lyme disease. So um, the first thing to do is to very, say a big, very thank you to my patients. So as, as a clinical doctor, I learn from my patients and listening from their histories as individual humans and how their bodies or individual bodies have reacted to a disease or to an infection uh, really is where all my medical understanding comes from. So I really see this as, as teamwork and really a joint enterprise. So um, yes, you're learning stuff from me, but I'm also learning stuff from you. And that's the same with, with, with all doctors. And in particular, I want to thank the local patients um, who consented to me taking pictures of them really for the common public good of doing what we're doing this evening um, of really patient and professional education, including papers and so on that I've written uh, and learning modules on Lyme disease. So thank you to my patients uh, in La Caba for providing me or allowing me to take your photographs and then give me your consent to sharing, sharing the photographs tonight. So if we start with this first thing about humans versus microbes, I know that we're all worrying about uh, Ukraine and Mr. Putin and nuclear weapons and so on at, at the moment, but perhaps our biggest, if we look at the long-term history, um, our biggest uh, battle um, as human beings is really the eternal battle with microbes. And obviously the big example of that is, is COVID-19 just now. So we obviously all have good and bad microbes, uh, our bodies, uh, function because we have good bacteria inside us helping us do our digestion etc and on the surface of our skin and all, all different parts of our body we have good bacteria and sometimes they get overtaken by bad bacteria which cause disease. Now uh, if we think of the different forms of organisms the most basic uh, form of organism is one called a prion which came into um, quite a lot of discussion about 10-15 years ago when we had bovine sp spongiform encephalitis, which you may remember as mad cow disease. And the prion is really, it's even smaller than a virus. It's a, a fragment of a strand of DNA, which seems to cause um, big problems or can cause big problems. And it was first learned about um, quite a number of years ago, probably about 40, 50 years ago, um, when cannibals in New Guinea uh, who were found to eating the brains, I know this is a bit gross, but anyway, they, they were eating their ancestors and they ended up getting the disease of their ancestors because the transmission through the cannibalism um, of this prion protein, uh, which caused the disease that they knew as, as Kuru. And uh, mad cow disease or BSE, it was in a similar, similar sort of category or similar cause of, 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 um, of microbe. The level above microbe is viruses, and obviously we're all very familiar with the 
COVID-19 one, its, its Sunday name is SARS-CoV-2-19. Um, and other viruses that we have in circulation, obviously influenza, things like uh, the chickenpox virus, herpes simplex, hepatitis things that affect the liver, um, HIV viruses, and effectively all viruses are a strand of DNA um, which live and they live inside a bacteria. So the reason why hand washing and so is important, so it's important for um, trying to prevent the spread of, of COVID is because the, 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 the actual virus itself, the SARS-CoV-19 thing is living inside a bacteria. So when you wash your hands, you dissolve the outer uh, bacteria, the, the outer coat of the bacteria and that pops that pops the bacteria uh, and therefore the virus can't, uh, can't exist. Um, so, but, so viruses are dependent upon a, a bacteria. Um, when we, um, next, the next level of, of organism that we have is, is a bacteria and uh, a common one, uh, common bacteria are things that cause say urine infections, um, throat infections, this particular one called hemolytic streptococcus causes nasty throat infections or sexually transmitted infections. Or this final one, MRSA, which you probably see in the newspapers, and that's really like a superbug uh, that we've managed as humans to kind of construct or cause um, by excessive use of antibiotics. Um, and uh, so MRSA stands for multi-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, the skin bacteria. Then the other things that probably as, as, as a botanist you'll be interested in, uh, the whole thing about fungi. Uh, fungi, we have fungi naturally in our bodies, um, but if they get out of control, they can cause skin disease. So really, I suppose really what I'm saying is a highly complex interaction between the microbe um, and how we respond to any invasion. And some of this is around the complexities of our, of our immune response. Sometimes we need help from antibiotics and antivirals, um, but sometimes these, these can cause more harm, more harm than good. And sometimes our bodies can overreact and cause collateral damage uh, can occur. And that's really probably the picture that's emerging with the COVID-19 virus, uh, where some of the damage that people are experiencing with long COVID, et cetera, probably due to the, the, the collateral damage of their immune system suddenly overreacting and overshooting the mark. Now, if we just go to the, 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 the main thing I'm going to talk about this evening, which is Lyme disease. Lyme disease is really what we call a zoonosis. So that really is the category of disease where um, it's an infection which spreads from animals to humans. And um, it was first described in 1975 uh, in America, um, in old uh, Lyme, Connecticut, USA, in an outbreak of children's arthritis, in other words, joint pain in children. And 1975, interestingly enough, was the year that I graduated from Aberdeen. So we've known about, um, Lyme disease in one form or another um, since 1975, really before that, uh, when we actually start looking at the hist history books. And what we know about Lyme disease is it's spread by ticks, the common sheep, uh, common hard-bodied sheep tick called Ixodus rachinus, and we know that is called the disease vector in the terminology. So the disease vector is the um, the piggyback thing that spreads the thing that causes the disease. So the thing that causes the disease is a bacteria. Um, which lives inside um, the tick. So it's the tick that is spreading um, the, the, the harmful bacteria. And in the categories of bacteria, the one that causes Lyme disease, this one called Borrelia burgdorferi, um, it's a spirochete. So uh, it's a corkscrew shaped organism. Um, if you look at it under an electron microscope, as in the picture on the left, and that's the same class of bacteria which causes uh, the sexually transmitted disease of, of syphilis. So in fact, it's a pretty nasty organism. All spirochetes are not very nice to know. Um, and what happens is that the, in the graphic there on the right of the person walking down the path and the, and the road here just in the grass there, um, what happens is that the tick uh, attaches itself onto the animal, in other words, a roe deer or something like that, and then they're not insects, they can't fly. So insects fly, uh, ticks are really in the same class as spiders. So they can only just really hop around and crawl from one place to another. And so they are transmitting the Borrelia bacteria from the disease reservoir, uh, which is really small animals, uh, deer, bulls, rabbits, grouse, all these sorts of things carrying the disease in their, in their, in their own bodies. And the tick is just really the, 
uh, the thing that transfers it the, from the animal uh, to the human being. So how do we learn to live with ticks which cause Lyme disease? So the first thing is I think we need to try and understand the tick life cycle um, and uh, the ticks as the vectors of the disease and their distribution throughout the, the ecosystem. Very importantly, particularly for um, the audience tonight, we need, you need to understand how to remove them uh, in order to reduce disease transmission. And if we can understand, if you, you guys can understand the early symptoms, um, we can provide you with effective curative treatment uh, in the early stages um, of any illness and bacterial invasion. So let's go back to the basic uh, life cycle of the tick and look at this graphic. And if we have a look, first of all, on the right hand side at the spiral sort of thing, and in the center of the spiral, you see uh, lays eggs. So what's happened is that the female tick uh, has, adult female tick has laid eggs. Um, she then, or these eggs then hatch out into the larval stage, which has uh, six legs. And at that stage, the tick is not infected or can't be infected. But if that larva goes and has its first blood meal, a deer that's infected with this breed, oh. deer, um, or any other uh, bird or small mammal on the ground, uh, it will pick up the Lyme disease bacteria into its stomach at that stage in its first blood meal. It then de develops into the so-called questing nymph stage of the disease. And the questing nymph is a bit like the te uh, a human teenager. They go around paging around, uh, desperate for food, and uh, desperate to uh, really attach to anything that they can see. So the questing nymph by this stage has developed eight legs. And if it attaches onto its second blood meal, that second blood meal may therefore uh, be something like a, a dog or a human or a deer or anything or any other mammal. Um, that what can then happen is the questing nymph stage, the, uh, when it's getting its first, first, its second blood meal, uh, it can then transmit this bacteria that it's picked up from its first blood meal um, into the human. Uh, they can then go on to uh, become adults um, after they've gone through the teenage stage, and then that's their third blood meal. And then the adults, male and female, then produce eggs um, to start the whole process again. And that whole cycle of the tick life cycle can take between two to three years to complete. Now, the reason I mention all this is if you look at the graphic on the left, the thumbnail diagram, you'll see the, that graphic is supposed to show you or tries to show you the size of the tick relative to their developmental stage. So on the bottom right hand thing, uh, with uh, just six legs at that time, you have the larvae, which is not going to be infected. But then the rampaging teenager with its eight legs, the questing nymph stage, the actual physical size of a questing nymph is really very small. It's probably really only going to be about um, a poppy seed size. And um, the ones that you see as tick or ticks that everybody thinks of ticks are really the big adult male and female size uh, that you would tend to get or take off your dogs. Um, now, the first thing to say is the vast majority of ticks don't actually pick up bacteria, uh, back beryllium. So even if you've been bitten by a tick, it doesn't mean to say that you're going to get Lyme disease. And that's a very important point of, of reassurance. Um, but how do we find out how many of the ticks are actually infected? Well, there's a sort of scientific process where uh, you take a, a, a white cloth, a right tablecloth sort of thing uh, through the forest, along the forest floor, so-called drag netting. And this, was taken, this picture was taken not far from Raid Moor. I think maybe Culloden, I'm not sure, 100%. And what happens is you count the number of ticks on your drag, drag cloth um, and then you put them through a PCR process, a bit like detecting COVID, where you look for the, uh, the, vir the, the, the uh, bacteria's um, DNA sequence uh, and then you can see uh, whether, it is, whether the tick is infected or not. And we've done quite a bit of research over the past sort of 10, 15 years or so um, in the Lyme disease world on uh, trying to find out where are the infected ticks which are infected with the back, which are contaminated with the, with the dangerous bacteria uh, within Scotland. This paper was published about 10 years ago. The interesting thing, if you look at this and the spots there, um, the black spot, um, the number of ticks, the percentage of ticks infected with the, the nasty bacteria um, is about 30, was 13.9%, not very far away, um, I think this is probably in Cairngorm, um, the white spot, um, only 0.8% of the ticks were infected. So you can, within a particular area, 
um, get different percentages of ticks um, that are affected. Um, these surveys are going on not exactly all the time. I, I, at a personal level, I would like these, these surveys really to be ramped up and paid for in a proper program by government. This most recent publication came out just, uh, just recently, uh, late last year, and, and was a survey done by a Swiss group. Now, why on earth we need a Swiss group to come across and uh, look at our ticks in Gerloch? Um, I mean, it's very good that, that they did, um, and they provided some useful information, but I think that's something that really we should be uh, funding and looking for ourselves in Scotland um, to get this information and accurate, up-to-date information on uh, what percentage of ticks and what the ticks are actually carrying. So, as I say, there have been many, quite a few ecological studies, studies, but we need to to, to doing this as a as a as a rolling a rolling process. And uh, in any Borrelia hotspots, um, probably between two and ten percent of the ticks are infected. And we know that there are hotspots for infected ticks in Loch Lomond, in Loch Harbour, the Black Isle, Murrayshire, Ewes, and Tayside. Now, when you start reading about Lyme disease, you'll probably see a lot, and also you might see stuff in the press about red, red deer being the reservoir up in the hills and, and people worrying about red deer uh, coming down off the hills uh, as recently in, in, in Kinloch Leven in La Harbour. But unfortunately, it's not just the red deer that, that can be the problem, but it's also the small ground living birds and rodents, small animals, uh, small mammals, and, and also very importantly, I think the roe deer um, in this area are the local reservoir for um, the tick uh, to pick up its, its back, dangerous bacteria and then spread it to us. Now, knowledge on ticks and Lyme disease is needed throughout the NHS, not just in Highland. Now, there's a group of us uh, in both sort of general practice and hospital sector and labs who've developed quite an expertise, expertise on Lyme disease in Highland over the past sort of 10, 15, 20 years or so. Um, but unfortunately, that expertise is not really uh, shared throughout the rest of, of Scotland and the UK. Plan at a technical level would be quite a complex multi-system disease, in other words, affecting different parts of your body, which needs awareness for doctors making a diagnosis. And one of the problems we have with Highland tourism, I think, is I spend a lot of time worrying about people picking up infected ticks uh, when they're coming up on camping holidays, leisure activity up in the Highlands, and then returning to their cities. And then probably the doctors looking after them don't know an awful lot about Lyme disease. So I'm trying to address that at the moment with a program I'll, I'll talk about in, in a minute or two. So um, and the other thing is that it's not really just about um, the, the, you know, the, the animals wandering the hills, the, the, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the Victorian red deer. Um, we do get small mammals and birds and, which are infected with ticks in, in our gardens and the ticks are maybe just hanging around on innocent things like grass and bracken. So we've all got to be aware of it, particularly in Highland. So as I said, between two and 10% of the common sheep tick uh, carry this in their stomach. But what happens is that the tick needs to lock onto the human being for between 12 and 24 hours uh, for in order it to get a blood meal back. What the tick is doing is it's searching for a blood meal so to get the blood back from you, what it does, it injects an anticoagulant um, into the human to then um, be able to suck the blood back. And sometimes this can cause, or most of the time, it can often cause really an, what we call an allowable local reaction at the site of the tick bite. Now, if the tick is infected, um, the Borrelia spirochete gains entry into the blood into the human being during this blood meal exchange. And this is an important bit of the biology because if we can intervene with that crucial stage of disease transmission during the crucial 12 to 24 hours with tick removal, and if we can remove the tick without squeezing it, we can stop a whole load of disease and a whole load of angst. So the public health response in Highland has to be about everybody being aware about ticks, how to remove them safely, and how to um, try and avoid uh, squeezing them. Otherwise, all you do is squirt the tick into your body, squ squirt the bacteria into your body from the tick. So tick removal is crucial for um, how to deal with this whole thing. And at the moment, we're dealing with, with the bacteria, the spirochete spiral bacteria that I'm talking about. But there's also some nasty viruses coming. There's, there's one from the continent called tick-borne encephalitis, which is quite prevalent in some of the areas of northern Europe. And that particular virus has been found um, in some of the ticks in the um, uh, in in near Thetford in in 
um, East Anglia and the New Forest area around about Southampton. So they haven't caused any human cases yet, but it's just a matter of these things spreading up the UK. And we also historically have had our own uh, Scottish version of tick-borne encephalitis, a thing called louping ill, which can affect sheep. It causes sheep to limp, and then uh, they can get a really horrible condition and can die. Um, it's very rare in humans in Highland, uh, the louping ill thing, but it has been described. Now, just coming back to how to get the ticks off with whatever the tick is carrying, um, the most reliable and best method is probably the one on the left-hand side, the tick twister. Uh, where what happens, it looks a little bit like a claw hammer. You get underneath the, underneath the tick and you twist and lift off. Or the tick card, which you can carry in your wallet, but it's, it's credit card size. It's got a little bevel thing at the bottom of it. And you, get under, you slide it underneath the tick and sort of flick the, flick the tick off. Another crucial point is where to check on your body uh, to see where the ticks have latched onto when you come home from your botany expeditions. The first point to say is just think what the trick, tick is trying to do is trying to find blood from you. So it therefore goes for the warm areas of the body where the blood vessels are opened up, that the skin is, is warm and it's, it's so-called vasodilated, the blood vessels at the, at the surface are opened up. So therefore it's going to go to behind the knees, it's going to go into your groin, it's going to go under the breasts, it's going to go in your waist, uh, the back of your neck, uh, in the hairline, and behind the ears, particularly if you're children uh, rolling around in the grass. So really what we've got to do is we can make sure uh, we need to encourage, a, a, um, and certainly on your bot botany expeditions, I would like to uh, encourage the idea that when you go on your bus trips to, to, to look at the flowers and you've been exposed to ticks, that it's socially acceptable for you to have a quick look at the back of your knees or the, or the back of your, uh, wherever has been exposed to ticks, uh, to, check your, to check your friends um, to see if they can see a tick. And also, uh, if you can't, if you just buy yourself on one of your botany trips, um, then maybe use your uh, mobile phone uh, for taking a picture of the bits that you can't see. So take a photograph from behind of behind your knee to see if you can see a tick there when, or, uh, uh, to check yourself. The other thing is if you do start coming out in a rash, which I'll show in a minute, uh, it's important to take a photograph of the rash on your mobile phone because the appearance can change over time and take your phone in to see the doctor to show uh, the doctor what the, the rash looked like. And if you're doing first aid talks um, for um, Duke of Edinburgh Ward or Scouts or Brownies or any of these sorts of things, if any of you are doing first aid training, um, please could you uh, mention tick removal because it's something that's not uh, exactly in the, in, the, in the established curriculums, but certainly should be in the Highlands. Now, occupations at risk of ticks and Lyme disease, it's really all the outdoor uh, occupations, like people who work in the forestry, um, people who work as on the grouse moors, as, as beaters, etc., because grouse are all very uh, covered in ticks. Uh, gardening seems to be a big risk factor, and domestic gardening. Uh, anybody involved with sort of fencing and farming, but other things where, where there's a lot of um, uh, shrubbery, etc., such as clear at the Highland, uh, the, the West Highland Railway Line, or the Northern Highland Railway Line, um, and ecologists. So anybody who is either a professional or amateur ecologist um, looking around in, in, in bushes and in the bottom of forest floors, etc., you're very high risk of picking up ticks. So therefore, park rangers, um, whatever Scottish National Heritage is called now, um, as an organisation, and and outdoor education and other things that you might be less aware about, like soldiers and police, uh, surveillance officers, etc., lying down on forest floors to um, check up on Mr. Big smuggling drugs or something like that. Now, um, roe deer and gardens, uh, all ages are at risk. And this is a photograph from the back of my own garden here in Fort William. And this delightful little roe deer and family of roe deer uh, live in the forest, which is behind our house and uh, they love coming into our garden. And the difficulty is that all ages are at risk. And just in terms of this question about is this condition increasing or not, um, I have four adult children. Uh, when they were children playing in uh, this same garden, uh, none of them used to come in with ticks and certainly none of them ever got Lyme disease. Um, when they bring their grandchildren up um, and their grandchildren at all ages are in our garden, um, they invariably come in with ticks and we have to have this regime of, of checking them for ticks. 
and uh, one of my grandsons on the left there, my daughter came in very uh, obviously just changing his nappy um, and came in rather animated and excited about uh, a dad there is a tick. So obviously I removed the tick and uh, this is what it looked like uh, when I, I flushed it into the sink and took a picture of it. And as you can see, it's got six legs. So I was able to re pretty confidently uh, reassure my daughter that, well, actually it's only got six. I can see that it's only got six legs. So therefore it's probably a larvae and therefore um, unlikely to cause any disease transmission. Um, but um, this little child sitting around in a garden certainly uh, can be a danger of picking up ticks. Now this was a wee four-year-old boy uh, who was taken in by his um, mother in to see me in my practice um, two or three years ago and uh, just because she was concerned that she found a tick behind his ear. Now it was relatively easy to take the tick off um, using a twister device um, like that. Unfortunately there were no consequences but if you look at the picture on the right hand side the yellow thing is the the nerve, what's called the facial nerve. And uh, if you look at the proximity of where the tick is underneath that yellow thing, um, that's the, the, the post auricular branch of the facial nerve. And if the tick had been an infected one and it had got into that nerve, then it would have caused a, a facial paralysis in that wee boy, uh, or in other words, a Bell's palsy. So um, we have to be very careful about inspecting children, or we should be very careful in Highland about inspecting children after they've been playing out, playing out in bracken or in long grass, etc., and looking particularly in places like behind the ears and in the hairline. So um, I know everybody's a bit worried about nits, and we're always checking young children for nits, but actually it'd be rather more important to check children for ticks rather than nits, because nits, nits don't cause any permanent damage. Um, this was another wee boy um, who picked it up, uh, picked a tick up just on his eyelid there. I was able to remove that uh, easily enough with the tick twister. I wouldn't recommend that you do this yourselves, um, but it's just another example of where, um, where ticks can attach onto uh, in children. I mentioned the allowable local reaction, and really probably what this is is a, an, almost a bit like an allergic reaction, a learned immune response to the, the tick saliva, which contains the anticoagulant to suck the blood back from you. And this is a series of photographs taken by a, a patient of mine who very kindly um, took this series of photographs to illustrate the point. Every time she gets bitten by a tick, she always comes up in one of these uh, local allergic local uh, reactions. And it's a bit like people, uh, similar sort of process, like when you're away on holiday and you get bitten by a mosquito, and you always come up in a big lump when you've been bitten, been bitten by a mosquito. It's the same sort of process. The important thing about this is that this doesn't need antibiotics. It just needs observation. And if it just stays at around about a pound size, just like an allowable, scratchy, annoying thing that comes up fairly quickly, um, then you haven't got Lyme disease. But I recommend taking photographs of it so that we know that it is just that and it's not increasing beyond a pound coin size. If you start Googling Lyme disease pictures, um, you'll come up with pictures that look like this. In other words, it's a so-called classical target type picture. Now, having said that, both these uh, two pictures are from um, the Highlands. Uh, the uh, sleeve rolled up uh, person is an Inverness person, um, and the uh, right-hand side person is a, a Lacava person. And as you can see, it does look a little bit like a target. So in other words, it's a, you can see where the center of the, where the tick bite has been, and then the ring uh, that has spread out to it. Well, that's all very well. And that's really what the ticks tend, that's what the rash tends to look like, uh, particularly if you live in North America. Um, and so most of the pictures you see in, of, of Lyme disease on the internet are, are pictures from, from America and Canada and so on, where their subspecies of Brelia are slightly different to our subspecies and our subspecies don't necessarily always cause the, class, the classical target picture. Um, and this is an example of this. This is a lady, a patient of mine, um, who had a tick bite and um, did get a little bit of a rash round about it. But, uh, but she and her husband had looked at the internet and thought this wasn't a problem because it didn't look like a bullseye. Um, what had she been doing was she'd just been doing nothing more adventurous than hanging a washing out uh, in the garden behind the house, and uh, rodeo are often in her, were often in her garden, 
and the ticket attached itself to what we think was bed linen and then um, it then transferred to itself um, onto uh, the patient, uh, onto her, ab her abdomen, as you see there. Um, and this is what the rash looked like. In other words, the, the rash had continued to spread, and this was seven weeks later. Uh, fortunately, she, the, 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 the bacteria didn't go deeper into her body, and she was cured with a course of antibiotics. But just to be wary, uh, it doesn't necessarily always look like a target. The other thing is that sometimes it can, the appearance of the rash can mimic other things. So uh, if you look at the picture on the left there, that's the back of this uh, gentleman's um, chest. And um, to all intents and purposes, if, if, uh, if I hadn't known anything about ticks and so on, and I was shown that rash, I'd say, oh, look, you're probably developing shingles, and maybe we've got to give you an antiviral thing for shingles. Um, this was a picture taken by one of my colleagues or this patient was seen by one of my colleagues, and um, initially they thought it was probably a fungal infection. Um, nine months later, um, this uh, rash had then spread all over the person's back, and um, his blood test was positive for the Lyme disease thing, so it definitely, the picture on the left, uh, is definitely uh, Lyme disease, although it doesn't look classically uh, like, it, you look, like it looks in the pictures. So one of the things about the reaction between, uh, just coming back to this point about the way that we as individual human beings uh, respond to the various microbial challenges, um, whether it's COVID or whether it's Lyme disease bacteria or whatever, um, it all depends upon how our bodies react. And the key thing from my perspective as a doctor is that it's all about the tick exposure is the key, key point in the history. The patient may not recall a tick bite and if we just start at the left-hand side, a uh, series of pictures, the wee boy with the, uh, the blue dragons on his, on his T-shirt there, um, he's got the tick bite infection, the erythema migrans on his face. So obviously, he was out in his granddad's garden um, and he picked up a tick, obviously, um, in the hairline. And then the bacteria's got into his skin and it's just spreading around on his skin. If we then contrast the appearance of that with his grandfather from the same garden, age 63, with the same ticks, therefore. Um, and this is the rash that appeared on his leg. So you can see at the different ages of skin, um, the, the, the grandfather, it looks a little bit more bruised in the center. And obviously, it's older skin uh, compared with the, with the um, childlike skin of the wee boy, age two and a half. In the center picture, we have um, a lady in her 40s, a healthy adult uh, female patient. Um, with, again, you can see the, this is her abdomen, um, and uh, you can see that the rash has spread to about nine centimeters on her abdomen and the central tick bite in the center. And then uh, on the right-hand side, this is a frail elderly gentleman um, who's actually housebound by this stage. And uh, he didn't go out he, by this stage in his life, he was in his nineties, he didn't actually um, go out of the house, but he had a very adventurous uh, long-haired cat that went in foraging around the bushes in the back of his house, and the cat brought the tick into the house and bit him. So this is really what this erythema migrans thing uh, looks like um, from in, frail, in somebody with frail elderly type skin uh, transferred by uh, the cat. Now, the erythema migrans, the rash stage of the Lyme disease, um, just to really just to finally complete my thing about that, uh, we don't do a blood test for this stage because the blood test is unhelpful in the rash stage. Um, that was a position agreed by um, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, NICE, uh, a UK guidelines uh, group um, in 2018. So really, the, as GPs, we have to make the clinical a diagnosis of erythema migraines, the spreading red rash after a tick bite, um, on really on what the patient tells us and what the appearance of the rash looks like. So one of the things that helps us, helps doctors and nurses that are seeing you for these sorts of things is please, as I've said, capture photos on your mobile phones uh, to discuss these with your GP. The treatment is... Uh, is very effective, but it's not very nice treatment. It's an, an anti a strong antibiotic called doxycycline, which has to be taken at a high dose of 100 milligrams twice a day for three weeks. It definitely works and gets rid of the bacteria, uh, but some people, if they're not warned about it, kind of give up halfway through the course because it makes them feel nauseated and sick. So it's important that if you are given a course of, of the, um, these antibiotics, that you take them with food. Hopefully the doctor or the pharmacist will advise you that, 
Um, but another very important strange quirk of, of these antibiotics is that you can get what's called a photosensitivity reaction. So in other words, while well, on the tablet, you can become allergic to the sun. Um, so we therefore advise people on this high dose uh, regime that they have to cover up, um, wear a hat, uh, long sleeve uh, sleeves and, and trousers, etc., and wear a sunscreen on the face. So even in relatively um, non-sunny days, uh, you still have to be very careful about the sun effect and this particular uh, medication. Now, the other thing that can happen is the bacteria can decide to then could go deeper into the body. And it's very important that doctors in Highland and elsewhere are aware of what can happen. So the tick exposure may have been months ago and the patient may or may not rem actually remember a, a bite. So one of the things I encourage uh, doctors in Highland and elsewhere to understand is that any new uh, symptom affecting the nerves of the legs, like say a loss of power in a leg or a loss of sensation, et cetera, one of the things that we ask them to think about is the Lyme disease thing and take a blood test. If somebody gets a single inflamed joint, um, in other words, a knee or a wrist inflammation, so um, I've seen quite a few of these. So basically a single knee joint that suddenly becomes warm and hot. It might be something like gout. It might, might be a new, new thing like rheumatoid arthritis or something. Um, but if it's a single joint in particular, we always need to think about Lyme disease as a cause and take blood tests. And if a doctor is thinking about multiple sclerosis, um, which has a variety of, of, of symptoms affecting the nervous system, it's very important in the early stages of thinking about that as a possibility that they do a blood test to make sure that it's Lyme disease. And then this, uh, uh, these two pictures at the bottom, very kindly supplied to me by uh, Katie, a patient in Inverness, uh, by this, uh, my colleague um, in the Kinmiley's practice, Stuart Smith. Um, this lady had been uh, gardening, just doing nothing more adventuring, adventurous than gardening in Inverness, and she suffered from a Bell's palsy. So as you can see in the picture on the left-hand side, the facial nerve, in other words, if you remember the picture of the diagram of the wee boy and the facial nerve that controls the muscles of the face, uh, she's been affected on both sides by the, um, by the bacteria. And um, on the right hand side, that's after she'd had the appropriate treatment. Um, and the bottom line is that all doctors need to consider Lyme disease as a possibility if somebody presents with Bell's palsy, facial palsy, in adults, but really, really, especially in children, it does occur and it has occurred in children. And it's really important that we pick those cases up to give them vigorous treatment. Otherwise, uh, a percentage of them can be left with a permanent uh, facial paralysis for the rest of their lives, which is obviously a dreadful impact um, from playing in your garden. Now, the whole business of early disseminated disease where it kind of goes deeper into the body, um, it may to, to affect either the nerves or the joints, um, it may take between six weeks and three months to get deeper into the body and cause its effect. So therefore, 30% of people who get this, this, this uh, deeper infection uh, don't recall uh, getting a tick bite and, and they don't recall having a rash. Sometimes they may have symptoms, flu-like symptoms, uh, and that may, you know, those feeling a bit feverish and ache, muscle aches and pains and so on. And this to me suggests that the immune system is trying to fight off uh, the bacteria. Um, and this is when the blood tests become positive. And obviously there are analogies with that sort of thing with, with COVID and, and the way that we, when we become, our blood tests become positive for COVID. Um, specific symptoms that I've mentioned, Bell's palsy on the face, warm and swollen knee joints, wrist joints, nerves, nerves not working and, and weakness. But also some difficult symptoms like uh, general things like fatigue and, and brain fog, which you hear with people talking about long COVID and joint pains in general. Now the difficulty is that the antibiotics work, but it may take, there may be quite a delayed recovery, even by getting antibiotics at this stage, it might take three to six months to kind of completely feel a bit better. And there are a, an unfortunate group of some of people who've had, um, where the bacteria has gone deeper into the body, they've had a course of antibiotics, uh, but they still feel pretty horrible, um, uh, sometimes up to 24 months uh, later. And um, these people can often be very fatigued and can't work. They feel very upset uh, about the limits of testing and knowledge. And I think there probably are analogies about uh, the immune function, the way the body fights off the bacteria, uh, a bit like the long COVID thing. So the long COVID thing just now is all about 
uh, a persisting immune response, um, despite the fact that the, the virus is long gone. It's really your, your or thought to be anyway, uh, your immune system overshooting. And one of the things that we need at the moment, which we haven't got in our, our, um, our uh, research thing, is really um, trying to, uh, to get a, if we're going to use the, re regulate the immune system or downregulate the immune system in treatment and do trials on that, uh, we need a better blood test before we can start doing this. On the reassuring side, um, a big Danish cohort study, which was published about four years ago, showed uh, quite encouraging results um, on return to work um, after two years. Uh, so most people, the vast majority of people, do eventually get better, even although they've been affected by Lyme disease. Now, one of the things that we're uh, very fortunate to have in Highland is the expertise of the laboratory in, in, in Redmore and Inverness. That expertise has been developed over the past 20 years or so. Um, Daryl Ho Yen, the bacteriologist at Redmore, the lab person, um, now sadly dead, but uh, Daryl was the, was the person who 30 years ago got interested in Lyme disease and developed a lot of the testing uh, regimes. Um, and I'm pleased to report that Rigmore became the Lyme disease reference laboratory for the whole of Scotland three years ago. What, what that means is that they were granted at a national level from the Scottish government anyway, um, extra funding to develop uh, more machinery, more testing, etc., and extra staff. The lab is now led by Dr. Sally Malvin, Maven, who is the lead scientist, um, and uh, she's doing a lot in terms of, of collaborating with the uh, different labs over the whole of uh, Europe and with the uh, rare and imported path pathogens laboratory at Porton Down in England. So there's a lot of collaboration going on behind the scenes uh, with other laboratories um, in what tests to run and how the tests are doing. Um, Sally um, has, in addition to doing being the expert in ticks, uh, she was given the brief for COVID serology um, last year for Scotland. So she's quite a busy, quite a busy person. Now, Lyme disease, uh, detecting it by blood tests is a difficult topic. One of the problems is that we can't culture or grow the Borrelia bacteria to observe it directly. So if you've got a, a urine infection, what happens is you send a urine sample up to the lab and it goes to Inverness, then it's put onto an agar plate and then you actually inspect the agar plate and say, oh, look, there are bacteria there and they're sensitive to that particular um, antibiotic. We can't unfortunately do that for Borrelia. So therefore we're reliant on either um, picking it up on blood tests once the patient has had it and picking up their immune response. You can uh, detect it in body fluid. So in other words, if somebody has got an infected joint, we can take fluid from that joint and, and you have, do a PCR test to see if the bacteria um, DNA uh, is in the fluid from the joint. But most of the time, 90% of the time, we rely on the blood testing thing. Now, fortunately, um, the, the technical term sensitivity and specificity about how good a test it is, a test is, and I'm sure you're all familiar with this sort of stuff with Lyme disease, PCR tests, lateral flow tests, etc. Um, how good is a test in actually picking up what is what you're trying to pick up? So these are the technical terms that we use for that. Unfortunately, the Lyme disease test has got very good sensitivity and specificity. In other, in other words, it does what it says on the tin. However, the problem is. Uh, that it relies on a delayed, delayed antibody response, which can take up to about eight weeks to happen. And um, we can't tell very easily between past infection and current infection. That's always a bit difficult. And one of the things to be wary about, um, please don't start using the private labs. People who have negative um, uh, NHS tests sometimes go to private, the, the private uh, healthcare system we then start using labs in Germany and USA, uh, and they can end up with getting false positive results with unpublished methods and no quality assurance. And the NICE 2018 guidelines was very clear. The scientific consensus in the UK is that we should rely on the proper accredited NHS laboratories that we have, uh, Rigmore in, in Scotland and the uh, Ripple Laboratory at Porton Down um, for England. So please, we do have the experts in the labs here, so please, um, just believe what they say and don't go off in a, on a tangent with uh, unassured tests. Now, the epidemiology, uh, we're always being told about the, the, the rates of COVID going up and down. Um, these are the figures for Lyme disease and positive tests for Lyme disease in Highland. These are the 2019 figures. So I didn't want to confuse things with COVID. 
Um, and if you look at the Highland incidence, that's the new cases, we have an incidence uh, of positive blood tests of 38 uh, per 100,000 of the population. The Scotland, Scotland figure overall for the whole of Scotland is 5.6 per 100,000 of the population. So you can see from that, uh, yes, we've got a little bit of a problem in Highland. And if you look at the data going back from uh, to 1996 and Daryl Huyen's data, uh, you can see that it has definitely been uh, increasing. From my own perspective, these are figures from my own practice here in Fort William. Uh, these are figures going back, this is just the 2018 figures that I've, I've taken so that we don't get mixed up with, with Lyme, with um, COVID, etc. Um, and if you look at the bars on the left, erythema migrans, that's the rash stage of the disease. And then the next one, that's the positive blood test stage of the disease. So the proportion is about uh, four, um, a fact by a factor of four. So the four times the number of rash stages of the disease compared to the uh, laboratory confirmed um, blood test positive disease. Then if you, if you go along to the purple bars in the middle, that's the number of cases, the new cases of melanoma, that's uh, moles that have gone wrong and are cancerous. Uh, in the same year in, our, in my practice, or um, rodent ulcers, um, skin cancers, um, which have to be taken out surgically. Um, and again, if you look at those, those are less than the, the occurrence of the Lyme disease rash. And, and the occurrence in 2018 of new Lyme disease rash was about the same number of people who, in my practice, who developed um, heart trouble, uh, and developed angina or required stent, all that sort of thing. So that's just to give you a sort of ballpark understanding about how common these, this is. And on the right hand side there, new cases of breast cancer, new cases of prost prostate cancer, much less uh, in per proportion of the population than the erythema migrans thing. As a curious thing, um, this paper was published by Sally Maven and others um, in, when was it, 2014? Uh, it was basically a survey of blood, anonymous blood transfusion data. So what happened was that the samples that people donate across Scotland for blood transfusion, the blood banks, uh, they were tested anonymously um, for um, whether they had Lyme disease in them or not. And this is the sort of postcode map that came out of that study. And as you see, the Inverness postcodes uh, found that Highland blood donors had 8.6% of them were seropositive to Lyme disease, and they probably didn't know that they were. Uh, compared that with um, Edinburgh, where it was 2.3% and, and, and the borders, where there was 0%, none in Dumfries and Galloway. So what does this mean? Well, it means that, that uh, some lucky people can be infected by a tick and can fight off the infection themselves without without it developing into a dreadful disease. Now, as I said, um, NICE 2018 uh, very helpfully um, tied together a whole number of things about which antibiotics we should use, for how long, etc. cetera. Um, so this is the NICE 2018 guidelines, UK level guidelines, um, really came to a scientific consensus, if you like, and what we should be doing and how we should be diagnosing things for Lyme disease in adults, children, and if somebody gets a tick bite in pregnancy. So it's all agreed and all set out. Now, coming back to the whole thing about humans versus the microbes battle. So this is a sort of graphic that I have just constructed just to try and explain this to you. I don't know if it works or not, but we just think of the human body as a, as a, as a, as a castle. And uh, most bacteria and viruses uh, try and invade the human body via the mouth and go down into our throats or go down into our respiratory tract, into our lungs. That's the way that most of the bad things get into us. And obviously at the portcullis uh, of our bodies, which are the tonsils, that's the main, the tonsils and the adenoids at the back of your throat, if you still have them, a part of the immune function that you have. So in other words, they pick up the bacteria as it comes in and try and neutralize it when it kind of comes in. Um, what happens with the Borrelia via the ticks is they're quite sneaky and clever. So they don't go through the front entrance. They don't go down through your uh, respiratory tract. They go in through a side entrance. And, and, and the obvious place, if you're thinking of an analogy, would be that the window of the castle. So they climb up the window into the window of the castle and get in through the skin to avoid detection. So if we just think of these uh, enemy soldiers kind of going into this castle, um, some lucky people, as I've said, not very many, not many lucky people, managed to fight off 
the bacteria. So there's a battle in the center of the court, in the central courtyard uh, of this invading bacteria. There's a battle in the courtyard um, to try and get rid of the invading, the invading soldiers. So uh, if you're lucky, you can do it yourself. But like most people, uh, you will need reinforcements. So that's when we have to prescribe antibiotics. So the antibiotics are reinforcements to try and help your natural immune system uh, get rid of the bacteria. So once the battle is over and all the, the enemy soldiers are now dead, uh, there will be uh, blood lying around um, on the, the straw and the, and the grass, etc., and the floor of the castle. And that's how we pick up, that's where we pick up uh, that the battle has taken place. So that's when, that's how the blood test works. So all we're doing when we're picking up the battle, uh, sorry, picking, we're not actually picking up the, the, the soldiers and capturing the soldiers. What we're doing is just capturing the dead, or we're seeing the blood that's lying around, the chaos that's lying around after the battle. So um, if we just pursue the analogy, so, okay, the bacteria are all dead with the reinforcements of antibio antibiotic reinforcements. And then with our immunological memories that we've now developed, um, we then send um, some soldiers up onto the battlements of the castle uh, to basically look for more uh, invaders. Now, the question, therefore, this is really about our immunological memory. So our memories decay with time and our immunological memories decay with time. Um, so they might be pretty sharp for the first few months after the infection, but, but as your blood changes over and so on, then our, our immune our immunity may wane a little bit. And you've then ended up, you've then got a defense soldier up on the, on, on, posted on the battlements and the general has said, keep looking in the bushes and if you see anything, then fire at it. So what then happens if, the, if this soldier two years down the track uh, is not sure what the, what the enemy looked like, he may be randomly firing into the bushes at the, at the rustle of a, uh, of, of, of nothing, you know, something going past in the bushes and firing off bullets. So this may be because the, 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 the defense soldier is not quite knowing what he's firing about or he's trigger in the early stages after the battle, he's very much trigger happy. So that might be some of the explanation for um, what happens in the, um, the eternal math battle uh, between uh, microbes and the human. Now, if you read that a disease is increasing, you need to consider a number of factors. Well, is it actually increasing or is this social media amplifying it? Um, is it just because the public are aware of it and doctors are now picking it up? Has somebody shifted the diagnostic criteria for the disease uh, in the, under the guise of either research or a set of guidelines? Or is it some drug company trying to push, push medication um, to, to get uh, people to take a, a pill for something. And this next question we have to ask ourselves, well, if there is an increase, does it actually matter? You know, what, what disabilities is occurring? Is it affecting um, our activities of daily living? Um, and what are the socioeconomic impacts of the disease increase? Can people still work? Um, because what we know from general society is that people in work uh, equals health uh, in modern society. So if, if people can still work and be, be economically productive, um, then that's not such a, a bad impact. So therefore thinking about this with particular regard to uh, the ecosystem, um, and we've got the human and we've got the tick vector carrying in its stomach um, the nasty bacteria, what's happened? Well, Sheep numbers have definitely dropped. I'm sure on your, bio, on your botany expeditions out into the countryside over the past decades in Highland, I'm sure you've all seen that, oh my goodness, there's less sheep on the hill. And if you start speaking to crofters and farmers and so on, they'll tell you the sheep, sheep price is dreadful and sheep numbers have definitely dropped. The other thing is, is that fortunately, uh, we no longer do sheep dipping. Sheep dipping was done uh, 30 to 40 years ago uh, with very powerful organophosphate phosphate pesticides to basically zap the, the ticks. Um, and they are um, very powerful neurotoxins. They can cause dreadful problems in humans. And um, so the question now for my mind, so when I started as a GP here in Fort William 40 years ago, I spent my early days in practice worrying about crofters uh, getting sheep dip poisoning. Um, and now I'm spending the same time worrying about crofters getting tick bites and Lyme disease. And one of my thoughts is whether the two things are in interconnected. So uh, could it be that the sheep are kind of going through the bracken 
and what, what, what did that used to happen so in other words more sheep went wandering through the bracken and they then got zapped with organophosphate pesticides to get rid of the ticks uh, therefore that was part of, of keeping the numbers of Lyme disease down. The other thing that's changed in our biology is that we are going we, we, we've always worked in the countryside but now there's much more recreational activity uh, occurring in the countryside um, all of us kind of going out for, for um, searching for our botany studies or, or uh, hill walking or whatever. The other thing that's changed uh, is obviously climate change, uh, warmer wet weather. The ticks don't get out of bed in the morning um, if the temperature is below seven degrees centigrade, but increasingly we're getting winters where the tick, where the weather is warmer and wetter. Um, that certainly means that we're going to get more all, round, all year round ticks. We've definitely got more roe deer in our gardens. The whole business of, of um, deer management and red deer, roe deer, etc., is all in a big matter of public and uh, public debate at the moment, as I'm sure you're all aware. Um, certainly, I think the roe deer uh, are a big, big problem because they come into the gardens. The red deer are still up in the hills, but the roe deer coming to the gardens, I think, are the big problem in Highland and elsewhere. We've got changes in grouse management going on at the moment. Uh, grouse are, are big carriers of ticks and um, we have got no data at the moment, nobody's done any surveys yet about uh, foxes in towns. I don't know, I couldn't tell you right now if the foxes in towns are or are not uh, carrying uh, Lyme disease infected ticks. We know that grey squirrels can be infected with ticks but I don't think anybody, in fact I know nobody has done a survey of say the ticks in, in uh, Princess Street Gardens in Edinburgh. Uh, we know that uh, Northern Europe is widely affected by uh, Lyme disease in North America as well. Uh, we know that tick-borne encephalitis uh, could easily come here. Um, um, we know that the ixodid, ixodid hard body ticks are widely distributed. Uh, on the optimistic side, uh, the drug company Pfizer, who developed the COVID one of the COVID vaccines, have been one of the, the spin-offs of that. Um, in vaccine technology that's, that's, that's been rocket, rocket propelled with uh, recently um, is that there's been a lot more emphasis on what can we do with vaccines and disease prevention and so on. So Pfizer at the moment have got a, a Lyme disease vaccine, which is at the stage three clinical trials. Now Lyme disease research in Highland, just to make a little bit of reference to this, I said uh, Sally Maven at the, the lab in Raidmore is, is very active uh, internationally and, and, and got lots of ideas. Um, the relevant consultants in Raidmore, um, the departments where it's affecting people, in other words, the, 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 particularly the, the, the neurologists, the nervous system specialists are very aware of Lyme disease. And in a similar way, if somebody gets cancer, there's a sort of like what we call an MDT, a multidisciplinary team meeting to have a meeting between the various specialities to decide how to treat the, the cancer. Uh, we have a similar sort of system in Highland where there's a sort of monthly meeting, which, which I'm one of the attendees at that, about um, how to, how to do, uh, deal with difficult cases and so on. So there is, there is an expertise and sharing of information that's going on at, at the moment in Highland. And uh, the two other projects which I've been involved in, um, this one in particular, this is called the Lyme Disease General Practice Sentinel Scheme. And uh, this is a project that myself and one of my colleagues in the uh, Research and Development Department in, in Raid Moore uh, have set up during 2021. Um, it's been quite a, uh, it's, we've set it up very quickly because the funding became uh, available. And um, I'm the principal investigator for this. And really, essentially, what we're trying to do is trying to get uh, better numbers in Scotland and improve the diagnostic accuracy and coding uh, of GPs. So we've got 15 practices in Highland at the moment, uh, which were switched on. So from initiation of the project to actually switching it on in the practices, we, we actually switched it on um, in September. And since September, we've might be managing to get data back out of the system um, to see whether the rates are going up or not, which I'm sure they are. The whole purpose of this is we know about the blood test thing, blood test results, and when they're positive, but we don't have accurate information for a whole variety of, of coding and diagnostic type reasons um, about um, the, the rash stage, and we need to know much more about that. And also what the risk factors are. Is it people like yourself um, in gardens, um, out foraging, 
or is it people in uh, working forestry, etc.? We need more information on who, who the, what the risk factors are. So at the moment, we've got 15 practices in Highland and um, the second stage of funding, we're just almost at the stage of, of getting that released, which will take us to 30 practices in Scotland and, and, and uh, going over the border into England with, with, with 10 practices in England in, in, in the risk areas. Another uh, project that I've been involved with a few years um, is called Lime Map or Lime App, and uh, it's basically a, a it's, it's it's a beta development stage. It's a phone app which is using space data to map uh, geography um, and geographical geographical and weather data to try and tell tell people on their phones whether the ticks are out or not. Um, provide. Um, on their phones, um, accurate information about what the rash looks like, how to take ticks off, etc. And then also as a citizen science type project, uh, try and uh, log in where you've been bitten by a tick so that we gather where are the ticks actually biting people um, and collating that and then using that in a citizen science way for predicting uh, risk. So, um, the general practice sentinel scheme that I've mentioned, um, that's really doing some preparation uh, uh, work for the vaccine that I've, I've mentioned that, that's been developed and is at the phase three trials at the moment, not being tested at the moment in the UK, but in, in other parts of Europe. So we're trying to produce the, I'm trying to produce the, the, the data, uh, which would then make a case for uh, approval by um, the uh, UK committees on vaccinations that you probably hear about with COVID. We've got the Lyme uh, map, thing which has been funded by the initial funding came from European Space Agency. Um, I'm very keen on this idea of trying to triangulate the local tick ecology and cases in different areas. We've done it in US, to, hoping to do it in, in La Haba, and we're, I'm going to start doing that with the Gaelock data that we've got from the Swiss group. Um, I mentioned that there's there's UK level collaboration, so we, we, are, we regularly collaborate with the Port and Down group, um, with a biannual research conference, and we engage with patient Lyme patient groups at that conference to, to find out what's, what, what they're most concerned about. We're working towards uh, trying to get a test of cure type blood test, and um, I'm working with a group in uh, University of Liverpool, which is just at the stage of uh, getting ethical approval to get blood samples from volunteer patients. Um, for doing an iPCR method, in other words, a new method of trying to actually find the strand of DNA in the blood and not just relying on the antibodies. And I hope that that might then lead to people with persisting symptoms being um, offered immune, immune modulation for late line uh, in later years. How to remove ticks. Um, I'd be quite pleased if, if you have a website for your botanical society, if you wanted to, uh, there's a, a YouTube video that I did about five years ago. Um, which is just a very short thing. It's uh, three and a half minutes on how to take ticks off and what does the rash look like. Um, if you can put that on your Botanical Society website, I'd be very pleased. Um, the burden of Lyme disease, well, in my jargon, it's a low prevalence, in other words, it's not very common, but it's high impact condition if you've got it. So some lucky people can fight the infection off themselves, as I've said. The rash stage can be cured with antibiotics if it's identified correctly. The early disseminated stage, where, where, in some, where it's gone beyond the, the rash stage and goes deeper into the body, can be more difficult to diagnose uh, and causes a lot of patient worry, a lot of NHS time, and quite a big treatment burden on patients. And the late Lyme thing that I've alluded to, um, symptoms can sometimes persist for two or two years despite effective treat, treatment, and obviously that can have big personal impacts on people with the uh, ability to, to, earn, to earn money, et cetera, and work. And that may be, as I've said, an immune dysregulation disorder. And uh, I have to admit that there are still many clinical uncertainties which upset patients, because patients obviously want certainty, they want black and white. Unfortunately, all of biology and all of medicine is if, buts, and maybes, and shades of gray. And so um, sometimes uh, we can't be exactly sure about things, and it's yes, yes it may be, not sure, I'm um, afraid that's just what medicine and science is all about. So, summary. Uh, the ticks are here to stay. UK Lyme disease, I think, is definitely increasing. Um, I'm in the process of trying to uh, map the numbers um, much more precisely. We've therefore got to learn to live with ticks in our ecosystem. 
and and certainly we mustn't do cause mustn't cause harm by fear of going out into the countryside. So we need my my jargon is we need a generational under, a generational change in the understanding on how to live with ticks. So that needs to begin at primary school level, and certainly with medical students. So I, I've I've been involved um, just last week. In fact, I was teaching medical students on this very topic. Um, Primary schools, I think it's, we did a pilot project in Spearnbridge Primary School, which went very well about trying to raise awareness in, in young parents about ticks and providing with a tick twister, et cetera. Because from my own perspective, I feel there's a clear balance of outdoor um, benefits, health benefits from children's outdoor nurseries. So I'm very keen that children learn in things like outdoor nurseries. So two of my grandchildren have gone to outdoor nurseries in Glasgow and I've been very supportive of that. And I'm very keen for older adults also to get health gain um, from the outdoors by um, um, going on botany trips like yourselves or, or anybody of any age uh, using the countryside. And I, I'm very clearly of the view that there's much more health gain to be had by going out into the countryside and continuing what you're doing and managing the ticks and being bitten by ticks uh, with information rather than getting a message out to people saying, don't go out into the countryside because it's dangerous because of ticks. That's certainly not the case. So, and as I've said, now we've got Borrelia bacteria hoping to get a vaccine up and running within maybe four or five years in Highland. Um, and there are some other viruses coming over from Europe. So therefore we've got to get removal of ticks um, and the basics right. If we get the basics of right, then, right, then we won't be having to rely on vaccines. If any of you are interested in this topic and further reading, <coughs> and you want to understand about the complex ecology, uh, the best book which you can just get off Amazon and so on is this book called Lyme Disease, The Ecology of a Complex Ecosystem. Uh, it's an American book, but it, it's well, very well written. It's, it's decent science. Um, you can read the, the central book there, um, Bitten, The Secret History of Lyme Disease and Biological Weapons. It, unfortunately, is from my perspective, I've I'm definitely talking about it. it's one of these fake news conspiracy theories saying that it's, it was all due to a lab escape and, and uh, so on in America, which is it's just it's just nonsense hype um, from America. Uh, read it if you want, but please don't believe it. And um, because it is just fake news and it's nonsense. Um, the next one on the right hand side um, is this book, which uh, says, well, could this be our first epidemic due to climate change? Um, well, I don't know, um, but the um, thing I would suggest, if, if that's the central thesis of the book, well, look out the window and uh, what else has changed? And as I've just said, well, sheep numbers have changed. Um, yes, the, 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 the temperature is changing, so the ticks have gone up, but also our ecosystem is changing. We're going into, into, into the recreational activity and so on much more. So I don't think it's quite as simple as just to say, um, oh, yes, this is all due to climate change. I think it's much more complex than that. So I'm sorry I've gone over time. I've gone over a bit of time, but any questions? I'd like to ask one, uh, James, if I can. You talked about grey squirrels having the vector. We've got a lot of red squirrels up here. Is there any evidence that they'd also carry, carry it? I don't think anybody has actually done any studies searching out red squirrels and, and finding the ticks on them and, and analysing the, the, the ticks for the PCR. I haven't seen anything written about that. Um, the main expert in Scotland on tick ecology is, a, is, a, is Dr Lucy Gilbert, who's a, um, an ecologist based at university, currently at the University of Glasgow. I'll, I'll ask that question of Lucy next time I'm speaking to her. But the thing, what, what I mean, obviously we all worry about red squirrels and trying to preserve the ecology, etc. Um, but the thing that I worry about is um, grey squirrels in city centres <laughs> and Princess Street Gardens in particular. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. I've actually seen um, a lot of reptiles, lizards particularly, with, with ticks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think I think that's I think I think that's the, I think that's an important thing to say, Audrey, because everybody gets a bit focused on oh, it's all due to the red deer. Well, it's not just the red deer; it's certainly roe deer. And it's lots of other birds and mammals. Mm. 
Sort of so what I mean, you know, obviously we, we've got the whole stuff about rewilding going on, and and the debate about the, you know the ecological debates about rewilding, and and so on. Uh, goodness knows what effect that's going to have on tick tick populations. I just it's just another thing that we're not going to know. So the idea, of, the idea of having ticks all year round is quite scary. Yes climate's going to change but we're going to have to live with that. Yes well certainly I was seeing uh, I, I saw um, at least one patient with erythema migrans in other words recent back bite by a tick in December this year. Traditionally we've it's always been that well it's a, it's a thing of the spring and the autumn they, they don't like the, 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 the heat in the summer they don't like the desiccation of the summer weather and the majority of the focus has always been um, it's more common in, in springtime and autumn time. But the difficulty for my is that um, if you've been bitten by a tick in October and it's gone deeper into your body and it's affecting your knee joint or whatever else it is, um, then that's probably going to be around, around about sort of January, you know, December, January, February time for that process to have occurred. Mm. So, so basically, I'm rather against telling doctors this is a problem of spring and autumn. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, keep an open mind. Mm -hmm. I find it interesting hearing about the life cycle because I remember a camping trip and camping, having walked through the grass barefoot, sit down outside my tent and realised my legs actually covered in dozens and dozens and dozens of tiny little ticks. Mm -hmm. Uh, not biting, so clearly they must have been the larva stage. But yeah. it was just really weird to see they were yeah. just just tight, much smaller than a pinhead. So yeah. they must have been larvas. That yeah. was probably June time. Yeah, yeah, probably June, early July. Yeah, I mean the, the, the common sense advice is is that we shouldn't you know we should always be wearing to the boots and trouser and, and socks and tuck your, tuck your trousers into your socks, etc. Um, the forestry people, people who work in the forestry and the Forestry Commission um, did some research on this um, three or four years ago where they gave some of their employees um, in um, trousers impregnated with pyrethroids. Now, pyrethroids are um, pesticides which are very harmful very harmful to the wider environment. In other words, they're very harmful to um, you know, ponds and, and um, the general butterflies and insects and so on in general. They're very powerful. Um, they originally come from this croissant, I can't remember, one of the plants anyway. Um, and they found that pyrethroid, pyrethroid impregnated trousers reduce the number of ticks that their employees get. Because if you, if you work in the forestry, in the summer, it surely kills other things. Twenty or thirty ticks on you, and um, so that's a bit of a problem. So, 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 pyrethroid and trousers do work, but obviously, the, you know, the environmental impact we always have to think about. Not going to work with your wrists and your arms. <laughs> the other, the other thing is, is, is DEET. If you are going to, if you, if you feel that that you're going out in in shorts and uh, t-shirts and trousers in, in, in high summer, what can you do to protect yourself from ticks? If you're not going to cover up, the only thing you can do is to use a, um, a DEET-based um, insect spray. Um, but, well, I mean, you're, you know as, all, know as well as I do that, that, you know, the pros and cons of pesticides, etc. Mm -hmm. So the best advice is to keep a sharp lookout when you get back off the hills. Yes. Yeah. Mary, did you have a question? Yeah, I thought I'd just put my hand up just, <laughs> just to say. Um, oh, I just wanted to say thank you. And I, I, I work as an ecologist outdoors. And I think after driving, getting Lyme's disease is probably the highest risk that we do, you know, they train us how not to drown in rivers, but really the biggest risk we have is, and knowing that Ragmore has got the center, knowing that there's lots more research and work being done, and especially in the GP practices in the Highlands is really 
really fantastic. So thank you for all your work. Um, just on that thing at repellents, we advise people to use, um, we'd read some research that said a more, a more natural, um, less horrible thing than deep is uh, acaridine. Uh, it's got another name, saltidine, but it's in the smidge. Mm -hmm. um, it's in the smidge, um, midgy repellent. Um, so yeah. I tend, I tend to slather like myself. Teeth to most things on me. <laughs> I've no idea whether they work or they're effective. I think it's basically trial and error. I mean, the other one of the things that I find, Mary, is, is that people will say to me, it's a regular event. So a couple will come in, uh, or you know, one has one has got the got the rash or, or or has been affected and will say to me, Well, I always get covered in ticks and my, my partner doesn't, or vice versa. And so there must be something which we don't understand yet about why the ticks go yeah. to the why do they attack, attack some people and not others? But it, it, it's some people, I mean, it, the, the, the sort of expression that I've heard used, which I think is a very good was, I'm a tick magnet. And um, one of my friends here who is an ecologist and, and, and me. I'm a tick magnet, and I think she's right. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I work alongside colleagues all day, and luckily I don't seem to pick up half as many. Mm -hmm. um, I've got so, I'm going, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> so Ben is a countryside ranger and her husband works in forestry and again he'll 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 pick up 10, 20 ticks and she'll she'll not pick any. It's yeah. Yeah, it's really really interesting. <laughs> um, oh I just have I have one more. <laughs> Sorry, I've now asked one more question. Um some did mention like lots of people have lots seem to have lots of like varied symptoms some uh, I've got friends who've had the achy joints and fatigue or the rash and some people that it's really gone neurological mm. is that is that different streams or is that just how it got into your body like you said about the ear thing yeah a bit of, a bit of, bit of both um some of the, the the strains that they have in North America tend to produce more joint problems than um, neurological problems the one that we have in the UK in Scotland in particular seems to go for the central nerve or the nervous system rather than joints. Yeah. Okay. The ecological studies, uh, I mean, we're getting, I mean, the obviously the, the, you know, the lab technologies are improving all the time. And certainly the, the survey, the study that was done in Gaelic by the um, PhD student from University of I think it was Zurich, I think, um, showed which she managed to oh, they 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 oh, about 2346 and um, they found a bacteria that we hadn't found before in in Scotland or in the UK um, it was only a small percentage but it was def and it's one that that can cause problems with um, or the case reports of it causing problems with with congenital blindness in children um, so but they're always different bacteria or organisms out there that they're going to do something so that's why we've got to keep the basics right are there any further questions can i ask just um if somebody has had a tick infection will their immunity last some time or can they be reinfected have you had cases of reinfection Yes, unfortunately, that's true. So, so certainly the, the, the skin form um, you can get, you, the immunity doesn't necessarily, doesn't last um, because it's only a brief infect. So, so basically with the skin infection, your body doesn't really have, it, it, um, if, if you, particularly if you're given antibiotics and so on, um, there isn't much of an, there isn't much to mount an, an immunological challenge against if you see if, if it's quick, if, if it's mm. quick, quick um, so yes, you can certainly get it again. And the difficulty from our point of view in the diagnosis is, is that the, if you have had a previous infection then the antibodies are still in your blood. And um, so diagnosing whether it's an old infection or a new infection is, is really quite difficult. We do try to do it by repeated blood samples spaced apart. And sometimes Sally, even in the lab can, can give us a, these are, the, these are the difficult cases that we talk about at these NDT meetings that I'm talking about. Um, and 
but the, you know there are gaps in our knowledge and we haven't we we do we do need different tests we need to we need a different test for, for whether the bacteria is actually in the system or not and can i also ask if you um have if you find ticks that are, is there how do we feed in information about ticks well to, to sally or yourself or well, I think well, this is well, what we're what we're trying to be doing. This is the, the point of the Lime app thing. So I'm not sure when it's going to be released. Hopefully, sometime later this year, which has been developed in Highland. This is this phone app, um, which will we're going to be encouraging people to gather information about where you've been tick, where sorry, where you've been bitten by a tick, and then plot it all, and then use that to, to help other people. So that 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 side of it is definitely coming. Um, the the question about whether um, analyzing the, the you know so somebody picks off a tick should that get sent up back up to up to the Raidmore lab at the moment we haven't got a, a very clear system for doing that so um, I wouldn't I wouldn't be I don't think I can start encouraging people to collect ticks to then send in to us um, mm -hmm. and get an, analyzed because uh, that would be a bit difficult at the moment from the lab perspective we might I mean, Sally and I are always talking about this sort of thing, so we might we might try and move towards that system maybe later this year. But at the moment, everybody's a bit distracted. I mean, poor Sally is so distracted with COVID. Um, it's a major achievement that we've managed to get anything going this year. Scott, look, yes. <laughs> well, thank you very much. We're all a bit distracted with COVID. Yeah. Yeah. Is that all the questions that everyone's got? I've got one. Um, I'm allergic to tetracycline. So would I be allergic to doc doxycycline? And is there any alternative? Yes. Um, if you're bitten on the skin, uh, there's an, an antibiotic called, and, and it's just the rash stage. The best one to use is one called azithromycin. Uh, amoxicillin, the penicillin-based ones are okay. But if you are in that situation... Sorry? Yeah. Yeah, amoxicillin, the penicillin-based antibiotic also works. Um, but if you are in that, that situation, I'm sure your doctor will be um, looking at the nice guide. The, there's the, the nice guidelines which we go by for treatment. There are these flow charts that I think I just quickly showed you about what to get, what are the choices, depending on what's wrong with you. So that's, that, that's great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, can I ask a question? Yes. Yep. Go ahead. Um, is is Lyme disease being adequately ad taught at an undergraduate level now? I'm from a medical family, and I graduated ten years before you, and I didn't know that Lyme disease existed. Uh -huh. And interestingly, my daughter, who graduated in '94, didn't know that Lyme disease existed. And my experience up here, we had personal experience with Lyme disease. And at that time, this would be back in, say, 2010, 2011, the general practitioners were not aware of it. Is it being adequately taught now? <laughs> I'm, do I'm doing my best single-handedly, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, the, good, the good news is, is that we've got a new system of training medical, uh, graduate entry medical students in Highland called uh, Scott Gem, Scottish Graduate Entry Medical School. That's a collaboration between St Andrews and Dundee. And what happens is the students are um, based in practices um, throughout the Highlands and Islands. So they're being very much taught in, in the community and it's a tremendous method of learning. And um, I was, I've been a, a tutor on that, that course. And, and in fact, I was giving them a talk on how it can, how it can affect the nervous system uh, last, or the fact it was the week before last. Um, so yes, there, there, there are a few people like me trying to trying to get it through, but the difficulty, the difficulty is the curriculums are very crowded and everybody is saying, we want you to tell them about this disease or that disease. So trying to get it into the curriculum is actually very difficult. Uh, in a formal sense, um, but yes, there, there is increasing awareness and increasing efforts to try and teach people both at undergraduate and postgraduate level about it, particularly in Highland. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
and, and part of the reason part of the reason I've developed this software business that I was I've just showed you a picture of in one of my slides was trying to give people the information when they need it. So I mean, I could speak to somebody today about Lyme disease, and they might not see a case for two years, depending on where they are or something. So the question is, how do I get? How do they have something in in front of them when they need it? So the idea of this software thing in the clinical software and the practices is they get the information and the pictures and so on when they need it, not two years ago when they've forgotten it. <laughs> Any more questions? This turns out to be the most one of the most popular talks we've had. So thank you very much. And uh, anything else, anyone else? Oh, well, it leads it to me to thank you very much, uh, James, for coming up along and giving us a talk tonight. It's certainly uh, given us a lot of food for thought, especially before we go on our next botany outings. <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll maybe have to get a bit more familiar with each other when uh, we, we get back, in, before we get back into our cars and go home uh, to, in order to stay safe but continue to enjoy our activity. So thanks a lot. And we look forward to hearing about the Lyme disease app, because I think that'd be really useful uh, for, for everyone that's, that's mm. gone out on the hills, not just botanists, but hill walkers and, and other outdoor campers and other outdoor people. So I, thanks I, for your time tonight. The main thing I would encourage, thank you very much for those very kind comments. The main thing I would encourage you to do is to, is to prepare in advance so all going by probably a twister and a card and have them in the in your rucksacks, have them in the god box of your car. Oh, yeah. And you can take them off as soon as you find them. <laughs>